Good morning, everyone. On behalf of the Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics, uh, I welcome you all for participating in this special seminar series on the epidemic of COVID-19. Today's seminar is the first one in the series. The speaker is Dr. Kat Paras. She is a professor of epidemiology in our department. Um, because Dr., uh, our dean, Dr. Lucinek, could not come, he recorded an opening remark for this series. Um, let's play his video re remark. Hi, I'm Dean Boris Lushniak, and welcome to the special seminar series on the epidemiology of COVID-19. This is an incredible moment in history for us to be tackling the pandemic of COVID-19. And what a great opportunity for us to be able to work together and to educate each other on the pathways ahead. First of all, thank you much to the organizers of this seminar series and for having this forum for us to be able to exchange ideas. Over the next few days, you'll be listening to experts in the field who want to have an interchange with you, an exchange of ideas with you through the webinar that we're presenting now. In the next few days, you'll be hearing from Dr. Olivia P Carter Pokras, well, part of our faculty here at the University of Maryland. You'll also be hearing from Dr. Travis Gales and Chung Fu Lu from the Montgomery County Department of Health who are out there in the front lines of public health action against COVID-19. And then finally, you'll hear from our esteemed chair of the department, Dr. Hong Ji Lu. So this combination is not just about that foursome presenting to you, but it's the interchange of ideas in the midst of a public health crisis. We learn from each other. So let's utilize the seminar series to get better at what we're doing. Thank you very much for attending this and let's learn together. Um, this seminar is going to be recorded for YouTube. And please ask your questions at the end of the presentation. Dr. Kalapros, it's your turn. Thank you very much for that kind introduction and for sharing the Dean's message. It's so wonderful to see the Dean, even if it's online. Welcome everyone. Um, for the very first presentation, we're gonna be talking about COVID-19 and the impact in the United States and Latino communities. Since this is the first seminar of our webinar series in regards to the epidemiology of COVID-19, the coronavirus pandemic that we're currently undergoing, I'm going to be laying out a little bit about how epidemiology is contributing to the efforts to combat this virus, as well as where we currently are in terms of the numbers. I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail, but I do have several links that are included as well as other resources, and they're going to be posted along with the slides on our web page advertising this particular webinar. So welcome. So I would like to take a moment and I'm going to see if I can move my screen where everybody's showing. I'd like everybody to take a moment and tell us what are you doing now that you would like to continue doing? We're thinking about many things that we cannot do anymore, like go to a movie theater, but what are you doing now that you would like to continue doing? Perhaps a hobby that you've taken up, maybe you are doing more volunteer work than they used to. So if you could put in the chat box, what are you doing now that you would like to continue doing? We're just gonna take a moment to do that. For those who are new to using Zoom, at the very bottom of your web page, uh, you, the, the screen that you're viewing, there will be a chat box. Take advantage of that chat box and post, what are you doing now that you would like to continue doing?
For those of you who are just joining us, we're just taking a moment to reflect on what we're doing now that we would like to continue doing, perhaps a new hobby, some more volunteer work, something that you're doing now that you'd like to continue doing when we start getting back to um, a more normal normal. Great, thank you so much for those of you who have indulged. The reason why I did this short exercise is because I'd like to help us move, shift ourselves into a growth mindset as we start looking at some of this information. It's important for us in public health to take moments such as these to reflect on what's going well, how can we do things better, as well as learn from the various bumps in the road. This will only improve how we're currently addressing this particular pandemic, as well as strengthen our own capacity, our own resilience to be able to continue to provide the care that's needed. So what is epidemiology? How are epidemiologists contributing to efforts to combat COVID-19? the scope of the pandemic, how racial ethnic minorities are impacted and Latino communities in particular, the longstanding issues that are getting public attention now because of the COVID-19 pandemic and how these issues are being addressed at the community level. I'm gonna be kicking off these discussions today with today's webinar, but you're gonna hear more about this as we continue on on Wednesday and Friday when we have our next two webinars. So what is epidemiology? For those who may be new to our department, may be new to our school, may be new to public health, or just need a little reminder, uh, Dr. Anne Ashagrau in her Essentials of Epidemiology in, in Public Health, her textbook, she defines epidemiology as the study of the distribution and determinants of disease frequency in human populations and the application of the study to control human problems. So as you can imagine, there are many people now who are becoming aware of what epidemiologists do, becoming aware of what public health workers do because of the pandemic. They're starting to understand that we are at the front lines in terms of trying to determine who's impacted. What is this? When did this start? And also trying to better understand the why. Why are certain populations more likely to be impacted by this uh, pandemic? So how do epidemiologists contribute to health policy? not only for the pandemic, but for other issues going on. Well, conducting and disseminating their own research. We have Dr. Don Milton, for instance, here at the School of Public Health, who has been explaining about his flu-related and now COVID-related research. Um, Dr. Hanji Liu has also been working uh, together with the states, and he's gonna be talking more about his work that he's doing in terms of modeling on Friday. We've served on expert groups that make policy recommendations. We could also potentially serve as an expert witness in litigation. We can testify before a policy making body such as city council or state legislature. And we can work as advocates within a health related condition to achieve a specific policy objective. There's actually a Facebook group, a new Facebook group for epidemiologists and public health workers to share information so we could better respond to the various requests and misinformation that unfortunately is being shared at this time. So yes, working as an advocate and to help inform the population. So when we talk at immunization policy, because everybody right now is talking about when is this vaccine going to be available and also what's gonna be required to get us to that point. There are many different players. Just looking at childhood immunization policy, here are all the players that are involved. An advisory committee on immunization practice, parents, children, and adolescents, employers, insurers, federal, state, and local public health agencies, advocacy organizations, professional organizations such as the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, American Academy of Pediatrics. There are many different organizations. So as you can imagine, getting us from the idea of a vaccine to actually the implementation of that vaccine, there are going to be many steps along the way, and it's going to be very complex. So it's definitely fast-tracked a lot faster than it used to be in terms of other immunizations, but we are all going to have some need to have some patience going forward. This is just to give you a, a preview of how epidemiologists contribute in many different ways to childhood immunization policy. There are many routes from epidemiologic activity to policy formation. Surveillance raises awareness of the issues. Just the fact that we are tracking the number of cases, tracking the number of deaths, tracking the number of hospitalizations, it raises awareness of the issue. Measurement research, 
We progressively refine our exposure and outcome definitions. For instance, our case definition has changed dramatically in terms of COVID-19 related disease. Our etiologic research identifies causal relations to natural settings. The three areas where epidemiologists really continue are those, contribute are the first three steps, surveillance, measurement, and etiologic research. We also contribute to intervention research in terms of piloting potential actions and evaluation research considering impacts of policies. There are five key steps of the policy cycle, from assessment of population health to assessment of potential interventions to policy choices and identifying what they are and comparing and contrasting them, policy implementation and policy evaluation. This really is a cycle because we're constantly tweaking those policy steps. So how do epidemiologists contribute to the assessment of population health? There are two main types of epidemiologists. We've got descriptive epidemiologists and analytic epidemiologists. Descriptive epidemiologists measure the health of the population. They assess health risks, health needs, and they identify priority targets for policy development. I would say I really have done most of my work in the last four decades focusing on descriptive epidemiology. Then there's analytic epidemiology, where it looks at individual level and population level causes. In terms of assessment of potential intervention, interventions, part of it is identifying potential policy interventions. For instance, what could be the potential impact of physical distancing? Synthesizing existing knowledge regarding their effectiveness. Find out from previous pandemics, previous episodes where we have practiced physical distancing. How has it worked? Contributing relevant new research as well as assessing the potential of each approach. What about policy choices? Well, there are two main approaches that we have with this. One is to project the impact of potential interventions on the health of the population. You may have heard from Washington State, one example of how they're doing modeling. Uh, Dr. Hanji Lu is gonna be talking about this work where he is applying different techniques of modeling to help answer the questions at the state level. So computer simulations of different interventions, as well as assist the process of consensus development. Many of us have done exactly that. In terms of policy implementation, we help to set targets for the chosen policies. For instance, our national goals and objectives are disease prevention and health promotion, Healthy People 2020, and as we develop Healthy People 2030, and form needs-based resource allocation for health services and guide development of information systems. We also contribute to policy evaluation from assessing the impacts of policies to monitoring future health. Now, a quick timeline for those of you um, who, who have been under a rock. No, truthfully, it's happened so fast. It's hard to believe it has happened so fast. It seems like we've been at this for, for quite some time. But actually, it wasn't until December 31st of 2019 that the World Health Organization was informed of a pneumonia cases of unknown etiology in Wuhan, China. And on the 11th of January was report of the first known death due to this novel coronavirus. At the end of January is when the World Health Organization declared the public health emergency of international concern. And the first COVID death in the United States was February 6th. They thought it was the end of February. They thought it was three weeks later, but in reality, when we've gone back to deaths that occurred even beforehand, people who had very significant signs and symptoms that sounded very much like COVID-19, they were able to identify that occurred much earlier. And then local transmission occurred at the end of February. We had on March the 11th, when the World Health Organization declared COVID-19 as a pandemic, national emergency happened two days later. By the 17th of March, COVID was present in all 50 states of the United States. And the World Health Organization cautioned in the 23rd of March that COVID-19 pandemic was accelerating. When our Maryland stay at home order occurred, March 30th. Several of us have been at home for even longer than that since the University of Maryland decided to extend their, um, their spring break to allow this opportunity for the pandemic to hopefully not uh, overwhelm our healthcare system. In terms of the status update, these are data as of May 3rd. Worldwide, more than 3.3 million cases. As of this morning, Johns Hopkins is 3.5 million. The World Health Organization seems to be a little bit behind what Johns Hopkins website says. More than 236,000 deaths. 
and we find COVID-19 in 215 countries, areas, and territories. Within the United States, we've reached more than 1 million cases and more than 64,000 deaths. The Maryland Department of Health and Johns Hopkins says in Maryland, we've had more than 24,000 confirmed cases, more than 1,100 confirmed deaths, more than 1,600 currently hospitalized. And if you look at the number of tests that are negative, add the number of confirmed cases, and you can calculate a percent of the tests that were positive. Right now, it's 19.5%. Some experts believe that we need to have enough tests conducted so we can take it below 10%, but I'm just letting you know what the current percent of the tests that have been administered in Maryland are positive. Our testing rate is only 2.1%. Surprisingly, Iceland is way ahead of, of most countries. In fact, almost all countries that over 10% of their population has been tested. The incidence rate is 411.77 per 100,000. Hospitalization rate is 20% of all cases, all confirmed cases. So one out of five individuals with confirmed uh, COVID-19 has been hospitalized. And our case fatality ratio is currently 5.11%. So we've got many different examples showing the who, when, and where. Epidemiologists have contributed to this. Biostatisticians have contributed to this, the counting and the displaying, different ways of displaying. So these are two examples of how people are trying to grapple with the, the barrage of data that are coming in and trying to make sense of it in terms of predicting when we can go back to work. Uh, Mark and Stanley came out of the middle of, of April trying to synthesize all this information about what they thought when we would be able to do the serology testing widely. They were thinking in June. They were thinking wave one, the in, uh, people who at the beginning of this pandemic were the ones who, who became sick, they're early infected, maybe they've built up some kind of immunity, maybe we can bring them back to work. So there, Morgan Stanley's predicting June. And they're predicting schools could reopen in the fall. Of course, all of our institutions, academic institutions are revisiting. And it may be there is some compromise about how exactly we're gonna reopen. Maybe not large packed classrooms, um, maybe spread out. We don't have all the details yet. And unfortunately, we cannot provide those details um, during this webinar. But they're also warning there could be a potential second wave of infection they're thinking about in the fall. And so it's important for us to continue these efforts for physical distancing. And I just wanted to point out, I found this, um, this way of displaying the data very helpful, um, comparing the COVID versus US daily average cause of death. And it shows that when you look at the average number of deaths in the United States during the last few days, the last few weeks, last few months, COVID-19 now is number one. It has surpassed heart disease as the number one cause of death. So ripped from the headlines. Now we're giving you the big picture. I'm gonna narrow it down to focus on Latino populations because that's what the real topic of this uh, webinar is about. If you take a look at the headlines during the past week or so, um, no question, African-Americans have been disproportionately impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. And that's certainly the case also for Latinos. Here's an example from New York, Hispanic community in New York City disproportionately impacted. From Twin Cities in Minneapolis, it says coronavirus mirroring other health inequalities impacting Minnesota's Black and Hispanic residents disproportionately. In Oregon, new data show Latinos in Oregon are still disproportionately affected by COVID-19. In California, Santa Barbara County's Hispanic population's hardest hit by COVID-19. So that is from the headlines. Where are we here in the DC metro area? If you look at the District of Columbia, data as of May 1st, one out of four individuals who have been confirmed as having COVID-19 are Latino. And that is more, like, more than twice what you would expect in terms of the percent in the population. Within the state of Maryland, it's about one out of five, 21.8%. And that is again, over twice what you would expect according to the percent in the population. Overall in the United States, it's about one out of four, 25.4%. And that's also greater than what you would expect. Now you notice the ratios for Maryland and the District of Columbia are higher than for the total United States. Part of the reason is because we do have larger families, more crowding uh, living in our metropolitan areas. And that's part of the reason why that's indeed the case. So why are Latinos more likely to 
be suffering from coronavirus, from the COVID-19 pandemic right now. One is because we know that certain segments of our population are disproportionately vulnerable. Immigrant workers are disproportionately vulnerable. They pose a significant share of workers cleaning hospital rooms, staffing grocery stores, and producing and transporting foods across the country. So they're at the, the front lines in terms of interacting with others that they potentially could get exposed. The second is that they're overrepresented in sectors that are suffering mass layoffs, such as restaurants, hotels, cleaning services, as well as personal services such as in-home childcare. And they are in the hardest hit, in, these in the hardest hit industries are the ones who tend to have lower incomes and they're more likely to lack health insurance and who are of a minor child at home. And they're more likely to take public, public transportation, more Latinos use public transportation transportation than um, non-Hispanic whites. And as you can see with the free lines, uh, the, the, the lines that occurred just about a week ago at Mega Mart in Tacoma Park, nearby Tacoma Park, these huge long lines waiting in line for free food, there's no question. Not only lower incomes, less likely to have health insurance, but also less likely to have the resources to fall back when there's a crisis such as this. Within Maryland, Latinos and African Americans are more likely to live in poverty, 13% in working age population. Among those um, who don't have health insurance, we see disproportionately Latinos and foreign born Hispanics in particular, one out of two foreign born Hispanics does not have health insurance. If I could ask if anybody has their, their, um, their mic on, if they could please put on mute, that will help with the feedback. Thank you. But that does not mean that the majority of individuals who are, have a lack health insurance are undocumented. And in fact, if you take a look at the data, national data, focusing on those who are non-elderly, most recent data, you see three out of four individuals who do not have health insurance are either U.S. born citizens or they're naturalized citizens. In other words, they are U.S. citizens. The vast majority of individuals who do not have health insurance in this country are U.S. citizens. As I mentioned, in the metropolitan areas such as New York and D.C. and Maryland, we're seeing households living in close quarters are indeed at higher risk because if somebody has been exposed, it's much more difficult to be able to do that physical distancing that's recommended. The average household size in Maryland for Latinos is 3.87, much larger than that for the state overall, which is 2.61. Among Salvadorians, which is the largest Latino subgroup in, in Maryland, it's 4.9. And they're also more likely to live in apartments. These photos are from a Washington Post article about uh, how high the rates are in Langley Park. Children often live in households with adults and the elderly. There might be multiple generations in one household or less opportunities for that social distancing. Really, we, you should, we should use the term physical distancing. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention about a week ago came out with recommendations of what you can do in terms of coping um, with COVID-19 in course quarters. But some would argue that these are not reflecting reality. What do you do with an, an individual who does still have a job, who is able to go to work, but has young kids and their parents are willing and able and, and interested in helping provide care, childcare. But these instructions are saying that the elderly should not be providing childcare. So what exactly do you do? It makes it very, very challenging. Uh, Dr. Don Milton, in his presentation about a week ago, he made a, a recommendation. He was suggesting that when people come home who are perhaps stocking shelves and uh, working in healthcare settings, et cetera, that he was suggesting maybe to continue to wear a mask when you're at home um, to help um, prevent passing it on to others and to take advantage of windows and open up windows to help improve air circulation. Those, so those were two of the suggestions that I got out of this webinar last week talking about his research. Now these health disparities, when we talk about health disparities in general, they're not new. They have been around for decades and neither are the recommendations on how to address them. They've been around for decades. So what are some of those core recommendations? I personally was involved in the Surgeon General's uh, those initiative that was in 1993 with uh, Surgeon General Tony Novello. Recommendations that came out of our multiple meetings was we still need universal access to healthcare, adequate infrastructure for providing healthcare, and enlarging the pool of Latino health professionals to provide culturally competent care. Well, those 
those recommendations are still very much relevant. If we could say something good comes out of the pandemic, hopefully this means that we will have that social capital. We will have that social will to make these changes happen. I'm also showing the 1985 Task Force on Black and Minority Health, which many people consider a landmark in raising awareness about the nature and existence of disparities. So what are health priorities for Mera Latinos? One is common issues are access to care, language barriers, and low socioeconomic status. The recognition that there's an interrelatedness of health issues to other health problems. If somebody loses a job, that means they are, um, oftentimes since health insurance was tied to that job, also an issue about losing their insurance. And the stress, the stress about um, living in these lower socioeconomic status conditions. This is all interrelated with the health status. Our in-person surveys that we conducted in Maryland have found fewer Latino adults have health insurance than telephone-based surveys from the state suggest. And Latinos are less likely to use emergency departments because of fear of the huge bill that they're gonna encounter since um, many are lacking health insurance. And also recommend the use of medical interpreters, US healthcare system workshops, licensure of foreign trained nurses and outreach clinics. We've developed over many years a framework for understanding the relationship between Latino ethnicity and health. You've got your national identity and geographic origins. And depending on the subgroup, you may have differential support from the federal government in terms of um, being able to integrate into society. So there's a political, historical, and legal contest, and there's also racialized institutional practices that are related to all this. This impacts on knowledge, beliefs, and attitudes, socioeconomic position, ethnic group, and that ultimately impacts everything from health behaviors to psychosocial stress to access to quality medical health care. And that impacts on biological processes. And this overall impacts our general health, our mental health, and our oral dental health. So what are subgroups at high risk for severe illness? According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, 65 and older live in a nursing home, long-term care facilities, have underlying medical conditions, particularly if not well controlled, have moderate to severe asthma, serious heart conditions, HIV or AIDS, or other immunocompromised condition, severe obesity, diabetes, chronic kidney disease, and liver disease. I've highlighted in yellow is those for which Latinos are disproportionately impacted. So not only are they low socioeconomic status, the types of jobs uh, give them greater exposure as well as um, greater impact, negative impact in terms of the shutdowns, but also they have underlying conditions that put them at greater risk of severe complications. So just to show you asthma prevalence, um, by selected demographic characteristics, many people understand that African Americans have high rates of asthma. But also, um, the work that I did when I worked with the Hispanic Health and Nutrition Examination Survey many years ago found that Puerto Ricans also have high rates. This continues to be the case. And in fact, if you look at these recent data from the National Health Interview Survey, Puerto Ricans have um, the highest rates of asthma. What about HIV? Well, the groups that are most negatively impacted in terms of HIV diagnoses are African-American and Latino men. And what, what in terms of severe obesity? Well, this has been a real concern, especially among the kids. Children's Hospital during the past week were saying that maybe a quarter of the kids that are coming to their attention is having um, the, the virus. A quarter of them have to be hospitalized. And the message that they put out was, if you have a child with an underlying condition like a cardiac condition, obesity, asthma, any chronic medical condition, this could lead to hospitalization or critical care omission. So where are we in terms of this level of severe obesity among Latinos? Well, in New York City, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention did an assessment and they found that Latinos and African Americans by far were the most likely to have severe obesity among these school-aged children. What about diabetes? Well, Latinos and African Americans are also more likely to have diabetes. Nationwide, 12.1% of non-Hispanic whites, but 20.4% of non-Hispanic blacks and 22.1% of Hispanics have diabetes. And these are age and sex-adjusted prevalence. Among Latinos, this varies somewhat, the highest rates being for Mexican American, 24.6% um, of particular interest within our area with a large Salvadorian population, 19.3%. But just think about that. That means one out of five Latino adults in this local area may have diabetes. 
What about chronic liver disease? Well, Latinos are more likely to die of chronic liver disease. And other risk factors include hepatitis, heavy binge drinking, obesity, diabetes, and metabolic syndrome. So what are some of the possible sources of disparities during a pandemic influenza outbreak? Well, uh, Dr. Sandra Quinn, in her uh, remarks last week, talking about health disparities, she referred to this particular article, and I thought that this was a reasonable way of laying this out so you can kind of think through why these disparities occur. First, there are disparities in exposure, and I've given you some examples about why Latinos are, are disproportionately exposed to the virus. Second, disparities in susceptibility contracting influenza disease once exposed, but we can apply this to thinking about disparities in susceptibility to complications of the virus, and we've explained that. Now talk about disparities in treatment once disease has developed. We've already talked about the differences in health insurance coverage, but let's talk a little bit more about that. Underlying conditions are less likely to be well controlled among racial ethnic minorities. High blood pressure control is lower, um, among those recommended to take blood pressure medication, blood pressure control is lower for um, African-American adults, 25%, and the same for Latino adults. Type 2 diabetes, worse glycemic control by many different indicators. Asthma, more likely to have uncontrolled or severe asthma. HIV, more likely to be unaware that they have it. One in six Latinos with HIV is unaware that they have it. John Eisenberg, who used to be the director of the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, many years ago came together with this framework talking about quality of healthcare, what you need to do to address quality of healthcare. First, make insurance available. Second, get people enrolled in insurance. Third, make sure their needed providers and services are covered. Fourth, make sure there is a choice available. People like to have choices. Second, have a consistent source of primary care available. Six, referral services accessible. So not only uh, primary care, but also make sure that these other referral services are available and make sure that high quality care is delivered. What this framework does not talk about is the other issues that we're grappling with right now. We also need to address healthcare barriers such as transportation, interpretation, literacy, hours available, et cetera. Initially, within Montgomery County, there was only one site that you could go to to get um, state-covered tests, and that was this um, admission site up Route 29 in White Oak. And of course, people in um, the northern part of Montgomery County, if they didn't have transportation, this could be very arduous for them to get there. Now, there's another site that has opened up. I also wanted to point out that with this transition to providing medical care through online uh, processes with the internet, text messaging, etc. cetera, uh, a digital divide still persists. Despite some lower adoption, African-Americans and Hispanics do own smartphones at similar shares to whites, but look at the difference in desktop or laptop computers. Only 57 to 58% compared to 82%. Home broadband, 61 to 66% compared to 79%. So big difference in terms of access to these, access to information online. Several years ago in 2002 and 2003, the Institute of Medicine put together a report in response to Congress's call for a report on bias in medicine. This unequal treatment report identified that these differences in, in quality and access to care could be explained by clinical appropriateness and need, patient preferences, but they also mentioned the operation and healthcare system, legal and regulatory climate, but they also acknowledged this discrimination, biases, stereotyping, uncertainty. This is the piece that got people hot and bothered about when the unequal treatment report out, but there's more and more evidence that shows that this does have a negative impact in terms of uh, someone's health. Um, data that have been provided looking at the implicit association test, looking at primary care providers and looking at community show that even primary care providers, even healthcare providers also have a disproportionate preference for whites compared to Latinos. And that's what we're showing here. This growing evidence that healthcare providers hold these implicit racial biases does harm patients by poor communication by providers, lower patient satisfaction, as well as suboptimal clinical decision-making in some but not all vignette studies. 
So what does that mean is they create a vignette, a case study, and then they share it with providers and ask them how they would react to that particular patient. And then they compare and contrast based on the demographic characteristics. Now, there have been efforts at many different levels to try to address this implicit bias, try to, to ensure that everybody has access to, to good quality healthcare. One of those approaches has been to establish these national culturally and linguistically appropriate services standards in health and healthcare. And I'll, I'll read that key standard to you because I think it's important to keep in mind. Provide effective, equitable, understandable, and respectful quality care and services that are responsive to diverse cultural health beliefs and practices, preferred languages, health literacy, and other communication needs. Important words from that are understandable languages and health literacy. So resistance has taken place in many forms. Many people don't want to make the time and effort to translate documents, to provide interpretation, etc. Part of it, they say, is unfunded. You didn't give us the money to do this. It's administratively burdensome. Our services are available to everyone, or they want the details about how to make it happen. How do we operationalize this? If you take a look at the wealth of resources that are now available, what we can do to protect our health during this pandemic, most of it is issued in English. When it is available in other languages, it's been developed by first creating it in English and then translating, sometimes just using Google Translate into Spanish or other languages. It tends to be very dense, it tends to be very high literacy. It tends to be really hard to get through, not to mention sometimes even hard to find on a website. And I already talked about the digital divide. So what happens when we do have an emergency? Well, we had an experience like this um, in Langley Park um, several years ago in 2017. There was a debrief of what happened after an apartment fire. And a couple of things that they brought up in that report. One is they said there were challenges with some of the residents getting sufficient information about aid and assistance and help that was available to them. They also mentioned the lack of Spanish speaking staff at the shelter, but at the scene of disaster when survivors were seeking information about shelter and other help. As you can imagine, this was 2017, this was three years ago. These issues still need to be addressed. And this is under the backdrop of what's happening in terms of immigration in our country. Just take a look at some of the headlines during the last week or so. White House seeks to lower farm worker pay to help agriculture industry. Halts new green cards, but backs up broader immigration ban. To suspend immigration to US for 60 days, citing coronavirus crisis and job shortage, but will allow some workers. And what is at stake as the Supreme Court weighs the future immigrant dreamers? These are all things that have occurred in the news during the past week. So this backdrop, this backdrop of immigration concerns has had a chilling effect. Immediately after 9-11, there was a lot of interest in finding out what is an emergency? Um, how is that, uh, who are trusted sources of information? How best to get information out when there is such a crisis? So we've gone through that reflection period within public health. And so working together with Montgomery County, one of the things that we did is we held focus groups after 9-11 and we asked, and we were really surprised when we talked to them about what is an emergency, they came back with not talking about terrorism or at that time, the, the crisis of the day was about a sniper. I don't know how many of you remember the sniper um, that was occurring in, in the local area, but they came back and they said, we're frightened because we don't know what's going to happen with immigration. This is an emergency. Some people don't even wanna go out. Well, this is definitely a reflection of what's happening right now. We've heard back from the medical director, from the director of Mary Center, one of the community health centers, that they had one of their patients died who was afraid to go for care. Even though he was legally, he had legal papers, um, he was afraid that this would somehow negatively impact his ability to get a green card. So unfortunately, this is still continuing to have a chilling effect. So where are we in terms of the pandemic? Well, we've seen that first wave, first wave of immediate mortality and morbidity. Many people are concerned that what we're also going to see down the road after a second wave of, of um, a resource restriction on urgent non-COVID conditions, we're going to have an impact of interrupted care on chronic conditions. We're going to see people who, because they hadn't had their adequate care for their hypertension, for their diabetes, et cetera, who are also going to um, have an urgent need to have those conditions taken care of. So these disparities have persisted. What do we need to do to address them? We need to rethink our approaches to addressing these health disparities. Those interventions and initiatives targeting upstream social determinants, we need to rethink them. 
we need to, to bring them back up because they are the most likely to be effective in improving health equity. Healthy People 2020, those national goals and objectives for disease prevention and promotion includes high school graduation rates as a leading health indicator. So it acknowledges the importance of social determinants of health. Recommendations to achieve health equity include what individuals and communities do. The American Public Health Association um, a couple of years ago came up with a policy statement. And this policy statement said, we as individuals and communities, we should advocate for political, social, and economic policies and programs that all improve health for most vulnerable and support health advancement in multicultural populations. That we need to understand our legal rights and obligations to uphold civil rights laws and disability laws. We need to advocate for enforcement of these laws and that federal, state, and local governments should adopt a health and all policies approach to ensure that health issues are addressed broadly. Health and all policies approach. So within Montgomery County, there is a Latino Health Steering Committee that helps guide the Latino Health Initiative, um, which is part of Montgomery County. And they come up with a blueprint, a blueprint for action going forward to 2026. And what they laid out as the priorities are health promotion, equitable access to care, meaningful participation, cultural competency, data, and health professionals. So you hear echoes of early on when I mentioned the Surgeon General's report, those report. These are long-standing recommendations, long-standing issues that still need to be addressed. So what are some of the examples of what is needed? Let's take a closer look in terms of the pandemic. Access to resources, access to testing, access to personal protective equipment, access to education in manners that are understandable and accessible access to dormitories or hotel rooms for, to self-quarantine or separate from others who are ill. This just occurred during the, the past uh, week or so within Montgomery County. Um, one of the activists that I interact with, she was telling me that she was talking to a patient who, who had uh, the virus, who had, uh, was a janitor. He was still going to work because um, he was able to continue doing that physical distancing, but his son had asthma and he did not want to expose his son to, to the virus. And so he was sleeping in a closet at his workplace so he would not expose him. So she was able to bring this story to the powers that be um, within Montgomery County. And so they've now expanded and they're allowing hotel rooms um, for people to self quarantine and separate from others. Supporting food pantries and meal delivery services. My neighborhood and others are really actively involved in terms of supporting the food pantries. Fund child care services, food and educational resources due to economic hardship resulting from the pandemic. Protective policies for workers. It's really unfortunate that the employers are really not thinking through what their workers need to have in place uh, to be safe. Streamline relief fund application processes. I've heard from many small business owners who have not been able to get a single penny out of the, the monies that become available. So definitely streamline those relief fund application processes. So two examples local that I wanna to bring to your attention. One is a new Facebook page that the Latino Health Initiative has created um, to get information out in Spanish in a way that is accessible to others. Of course, I mentioned the difficulties in, in um, having access to the internet, but it was one way of trying to get the information out. Another is talking to a friend of mine who's a gerontologist, um, uh, bringing to her a concern by one of our community members who was saying there was nothing positive or proactive for the elderly. None of the messaging. Basically, it was you go out there, you get exposed, you're going to die. And she said, there's got to be something better. And so um, Ana Maria Esquerda has created uh, videos in both English and Spanish to address that particular concern. So one wonderful thing that's coming out of this pandemic is all the people who are stepping up and, and bringing their expertise um, and all of their skills to bear to address this pandemic. So keeping that in mind, we want to think about individuals as whole persons. We need to address issues. This is from discussions we had in 2017 in Pittsburgh with patients living with chronic pain. We want to balance plain English without dumbing down. We want to consider the person as a whole person. We want to eliminate barriers to particip participation. We want to understand the barriers. We need to advocate for the patient, take them at the word, find a common denominator. We want to create bi-directional understanding. We 
need to consider what's important to communicate with each other, that we're not just numbers going forward. And participating in this webinar, as well as participating and reflective ac action is really important within public health. We're not really trained in how to do this, but I encourage you to take a moment, take a moment to think about what you've learned so far about the pandemic. How can this be improved upon? How can you expand upon? Don't, don't just you know, get so overwhelmed that you're not taking a moment for yourself. It's important to put that mask on. Remember the, 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 um, the instructions when you're on the airplane? It's important to put that mask on before you help others. That reflective learning can help to lead to a deeper understanding of one's unconscious thoughts, attitudes, and biases, promote that self-awareness, confidence, and growth, serve as a tool to elicit ongoing change and improvements in clinical effectiveness and quality of service, and build on developmental process of reflective learning. In summary, epidemiologists are contributing in many ways to efforts to combat COVID-19. Latinx are more likely to get COVID-19 and to also suffer from the complications because based on underlying conditions, there's an interrelatedness of health issues to other health problems that have to be combated. Many Latinx have underlying conditions that are not well controlled, which puts them at higher risk of this severe illness. And there are long-standing recommendations to improve access and quality care that need to be implemented. Thank you. So we're ready for questions. Hi, um, thank you for this great presentation. This is Juan Alvarez and question is, do we know of any model available where these realities of the Latino community in terms of the health disparities, socioeconomic status are coupled with what's going on, you know, at the physiological level for the individuals as Latinos? Let's say, you know, if we can put together the socioeconomic factors with, um, you know, the incidence of diabetes and obesity and other diseases that you mentioned in terms of being that sort of like a predictor of how the community will respond to the, to the pandemic? Well, when, 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 thank, thank you very much for your question. I'll see if I can, um, I, I can understand your question. Um, you're asking for people with underlying conditions what we can do to uh, make sure they get the care that they need. Well, more if we have like some models that allow us to simulate or forecast what will happen to the community as the pandemic goes on. So we know that all these factors influence, you know, our, um, how prompt we are to, to, to get infected, right? With the COVID-19. So I'm wondering if we have some models where we account all these factors and then we can have an idea what's the reality looking like for the Latino community? Ah, so you're asking about epidemiologic statistical modeling. Right. Okay, well, um, Dr. Hanji Liu is gonna be giving a presentation in regards to modeling on Friday. So I encourage you to participate in that. But a couple of things to keep in mind. One is there are many factors going into whether or not um, somebody uh, actually comes down with the infection and also whether somebody comes down with severe complications. So from what I understand, the amount that they're exposed to and the duration of the exposure is really important in terms of whether or not they get sick. So that may be something that also has to be taken into account. This is, we are, this is a rapidly changing process. There's so many questions that we don't have the answers for yet. And you're going to see many different models out there, and, and they're going to talk about ranges, ranges. And we look to see what is in those ranges. No question, if you're looking at just within the last few days, because I gave a presentation for Montgomery Hospice on uh, this past Wednesday, just the last few days, the proportion of cases within Maryland, within DC, within the United States who are Latino, that percentage has gone up and it's going to continue to go up as people get tested and get identified as having the virus. So I would expect we're gonna have a greater burden on Latinos than we're currently seeing right now. I think it's early on. Some people argue that you're not seeing the mortality among African-Americans that you were initially expecting. And so there's some discussion in the epidemiologic chat rooms about why that might be occurring. Part of it might be is that we've got a younger population 
Um, so that might be the reason why you're not seeing the mortality um, that you were expecting. But also it may be we're not waiting long enough, okay? That within you know, a longer period of time, we might see the, those hospitalized patients also dying, unfortunately. So there's a lot that we don't know. I don't know if Dr. Hanji Lu wants to give a preview about his presentation or hold this question to bring it up for Friday. Uh, yes, that's a good question. I'm going to address it uh, in my seminar. Now, the question is, once we know the reality, do we really need a model to predict the reality? Given we know the reality, we know COVID-19 affects this uh, uh, special population of Latino. Yeah, I'm going to address it. Thank you. Any other questions? Oh, I see somebody just posted a question. Are there resources on Latinx outreach available for our lay health educators? Communication kit that's been reviewed for literacy level and translation quality takes a collaboration of village residents and external support to create the change required. Absolutely agree, Janet Harden. I came up with a list of um, Spanish language resources, um, everything from the Centers for Disease Control Prevention to the University of Maryland um, Extension Service. That is also gonna be posted on the webpage for this particular webinar, so I encourage you to turn to that. Also additional materials are constantly be posted on the Latino Health Initiative of Montgomery County's Facebook page, which is open to the public. So you're certainly welcome to do that. The feedback that I got in regards to the, the list of resources from the University of Maryland Extension Service is that some of them are not grammatically correct. As I said, it appears what's happened in the rush to get information out in different languages, that materials that were written in English were then translated through Google Translate and then cranked out there. Um, and so the University of Maryland Extension Service said that this was something that they thought it's very helpful to have somebody go through and sort of decide what of these materials to, to disseminate. But I do encourage you also to share the videos that my colleague Ana Maria Izquierdo has created specifically to help address um, the lack of information that was more positive and proactive for um, for the elderly. She has it available both in English and in Spanish, and I've got very nice feedback from other people that I've shared it with. Oh, great. Thank you. Thank you, Bennett. Bennett has posted the link to the webpage um, that includes the slides as well as the Spanish language resources. Janet, did I answer your question or does anybody have any other questions? Well, while we're waiting for you to, to share your questions, I did want to go back because we started on thinking about what we're doing now that we'd like to continue doing. And I wanted to share some of those answers that people had. Um, exercising regularly, cooking all meals, taking daily walks, learning new ways of communicating and learning, including how to use Zoom, right? Um, helping my children with their homework, working more one-on-one -on -one with students, connecting with friends and family more quick, quick frequently, growing vegetables in my yard, connecting more with experts locally, nationally, internationally, taking advantage of telework more often, cooking homemade meals, and quality time with families. Telework is a definite plus. Thank you for sharing that. Looks like we have another message. Oh, great, Janet says she, she answers it. Okay, then, um, then somebody else said, spend more quality time with my family and continue practicing mindfulness. So all examples of things that uh, we hope we're gonna continue doing after um, this gets back more to the, more, more um, connected that we're being able to physically be present and not just uh, remotely be present. Any other questions? I know I, I hit you with a lot of information. So Hanji, did you want to um, introduce the topics that are going to occur on Wednesday and Friday? Yeah, uh, well, thank you very much for such 
uh, informative uh, presentation. And also, uh, I want to take this opportunity to thank all participants today. So we are going to have the sec second seminar of the uh, special series. Um, Dr. Charles Gales and Dr. Chang Hu Liu from the Montgomery Health Department will talk about the local responses for COVID-19, um, which is again, again on, on Tuesday, no, Wednesday. Right, exactly. Thank you on Wednesday. And, and Dr. Liu, you're going to be talking on Friday. Yes. Okay, so if there are no other questions, we may just stop here. Okay, wait, oh, somebody just, okay, all right, th thank you. So Bennett is just sharing the information about the webinar um, coming up. Uh, we also are trying to organize some uh, presentations to bring in our colleagues from around the world who have experience in terms of addressing the coronavirus in other countries. And so we're hoping to be able to announce that soon. So those of you who are on um, today participating, please stay tuned to that website we'll continue to post additional webinars as they come up. Let us know if there are any topics that we didn't cover this week that you have interest in. We'll see what we can do to bring the resources to bear to address that issue. Great, great. Let's just stop here. Okay, great. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful day and um, stay healthy. See you on Wednesday.